All right, we are joined by Gonzaga coach Mark Few. We're going to do the standard procedure. We'll open up with a statement from Coach Few and then open up to questions. Same procedure as last time. Uh, coach, the floor is yours. Uh, obviously, it is a great honor, and uh, we're very excited to, to be here again for the fifth straight time in, uh, in the Sweet 16, which is uh, just kind of an incredible streak that, uh, you know, the players at Gonzaga have been able to, uh, to accomplish. It's, uh, it's not easy getting through that first weekend, and, and I couldn't be more proud of, of this group, how they kind of managed and, and navigated their way uh, through it, and especially uh, in lieu, we weren't feeling great about how we played in our, our conference tournament. So uh, it was great to see us get through that. Uh, uh, looking forward to, to uh, uh, playing Florida State, but also uh, understanding just, man, oh, man, are they a very, very good basketball team that, uh, uh, that just does a great job of defensively taking you out of, of what you want to do and, and then offensively just coming at you with, you know, just a bunch of uh, uh, bodies and always, uh, you know, coming and coming and coming, both on the glass and in transition. And then when they're making threes like they did the last game, uh, very impressive. OK, we'll open up to questions. Please raise your hand. I'll call on you on the order I see you. And then we'll get a microphone to you. Any questions for Coach Few? OK, we have two in the back and one in the front. So we'll go very, very back in the corner, then Mark, and then in the middle. Uh, Mark, uh, Chuck Culpepper from the Washington Post. Last year, you mentioned in your post-game remarks that um, Leonard playing so many guys that many minutes is a really hard thing for a coach to do. In general, what are the worries about that? I mean, maybe like envy among players, or maybe flow, or something. What would be the worries and the worries that they've clearly overcome? Uh, I mean, I would just say that. I mean, most of these guys want to play. 40 minutes and don't ever want to come out. I mean, my guys don't like coming out of games. Uh, so uh, it's just a great job by he and his staff uh, setting the culture that, you know, A, when you're out there, you're going to play crazy hard and give it everything you got. And then B, you're passing the baton to the next guy. And, and he's fine with that. So I think that's probably the most difficult thing is, is that. And then they, they, they obviously do a wonderful job in explaining that recruiting too because usually you know when you're recruiting they, everybody wants to start and wants to wants to shoot and wants to play 40 minutes a game so uh, I tip my hat to uh, what they've been able to do there and, and uh, it's a system that certainly has worked and, and worked very well. Mark go ahead in the very back. Uh, Mark Wicker Orange County Register could you kind of I know you've done this before but kind of describe Brandon's development through the red shirt year, through the transfers, and what's, I'm sure he's better at a lot of things than he was then, but what are the biggest things that you guys have uh, developed him on? Yeah, well, I mean, he, to be honest with you, he's developed himself. I mean, he, he did a great job, uh, actually, from uh, the time he decided to transfer b before he got up to Gonzaga, because uh, the, the the clips that I watched him when he was at San Jose State, uh, when my assistant Brian Michelson brought brought him to me, he uh, uh, said, "Now, Coach, okay, he's really athletic. He's got a knack for making stuff around the rim, but this shot is broken and cannot be fixed." <laughs> and by the time he got to Gonzaga, I was like, I, "I don't know about that. I think it looks pretty good." And he worked extremely hard on it. Uh, Brandon did, and obviously the staff did a great job also. But now it's to the point where, I mean, he can really shoot the ball out to three. Uh, I think he's grown uh, with his feel for the game. You know, when you play in our system as a big, you know, if you look over the history of the Olenix and Sabonis's and Collins's and, and uh, Karnowski's, Turioff's, guys like that, I mean, we, 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 we really want our bigs to initiate a lot of our offensive action. And, and Brandon's really grown just in the last couple months uh, with that. Uh, I mean, I, I, I thought he was going to be really, really good for us, but I mean, I, I, not even I predicted that he'd be this good, and he's he's been, you know, phenomenal a, a lot of nights. And and guys, I had I, or I had no uh, idea when somebody threw out the stat that he has more blocks than he has uh, 
misses on the year. I mean, that, that is just a, an unbelievable statistic at this point in the year. We're going to go to the fourth row right here. in the. Uh, Eddie Pels from AP. Um, Leonard was sitting in that chair about an hour ago and said, you're the uh, John Wooden of this generation when it comes to West Coast basketball. Thoughts? Uh, that, that might be the greatest exaggeration of, of, uh, of all time. Uh, John, nobody can, can uh, hold up to John Wooden, and he's obviously one of my heroes and read every possible uh, book written about him. So, uh, wow. Well, I, I guess maybe just as a follow-up, you know, uh, the, the pyramid and everything he was about, is there anything you like the most from his messages? Well, there's a, there's a bunch. I mean, he's a man of uh, had great faith and was able to keep his faith, uh, uh, you know, during and throughout his whole career in this crazy profession. Um, I always loved the way his teams played. They had an unselfishness about them, even though they had great players. And, uh, you know, so, I mean, that's something that I think we really try, uh, you know, and, and I think we've done a nice job with that at Gonzaga. Uh, you know, and again, I, I, anything I could take out and, and try to uh, apply both to my team and my own uh, personal life, I did, because he's, he's one of, definitely one of my heroes in, in life. We'll go back to Mark in the very back, please. Mark, you had a lot of decisive wins, as you've had in other years, but when you have a lot of decisive wins, do you spend extra time in practice going over the late game close situations that you inevitably are going to run into? Yeah, that's a great question, Mark, and, and, and the answer is yes. I mean, we've probably spent more time, I think our team would tell you, in practice just playing little three-minute games, two-minute games, one minute or 30 second scenarios, you know, probably, you know, you get a rhythm to your practices and we'd probably do those at least twice a week throughout, you know, our, our league schedule, which was Thursday, Saturday. And so, and try to vary it. I mean, we, I'd send my main crew out there and make them down seven with three to go and have to deal with that or up seven with two to go and things like that. So, but to be honest with you, nothing really simulates, you know, game type scenarios and game type a action and then play Florida State I mean it's literally impossible to simulate <laughs> the length and the size and the athleticism uh, that they come come at you and, and uh, so you know you just you do the best job that you can what it's obviously a blessing to be able to win all those games by that many points it's a lot easier on the stomach and a lot easier on the heart but I guess if there is a downside to something like that, it would be, you know, maybe not getting in-game work on into game stuff. We'll go right, very back corner, Chuck. You were talking about preparing for uh, Florida State. Just those numbers. Does that make the the tape study, uh, all the combos and everything, more complicated? Uh, I mean, we've, we've tried to simplify it for our guys actually, and uh, uh, you know, I, I mean it. It, if you just look at it from kind of a guard position and then a big position, that's kind of how we've broken it down for our guys. And then obviously, when when Cabin Gelly's on the floor, they're different than when you know the big the big fellows on the floor. So, trying to kind of break it down into those things, I think, to make it a little more easier easier to assimilate uh, for the guys. I, I actually playing them last year, I think, really helps us. Um, at least at this point in the preparation, we'll, we'll find out more tomorrow night. But it, it, it helps that we experienced that last year when we're trying to tell these guys what it's going to be like. Any further questions for Coach Few? Final call. Thank you, Coach. Yep, thanks. All right, we'll be back at 1250 with Texas Tech. 1250 with Texas Tech. That'll be Coach Chris Beard. Then at 105, we'll have student athletes Brandon Francis, Tariq Owens, Matt Mooney, and Narenz Odaisi.
button B as in boy. Download frequency 11975.5 V as in Victor. For those of you who haven't been in the room previously, I ask you all to please silence your phones. Uh, please, you may shoot still photos, but no video, please, while in the room. Uh, raise your hand, we'll call on you in the order that I see you. Wait for the microphone. Our microphone handlers are David and Gail. They will get the microphone to you. Uh, when you before you ask your question, please identify yourself and your affiliation. Uh, Tom, Aaron, and Les are our stenography team. They will get the quotes out within minutes after the end of the press conference. Finally, when you're ready to ask your question, please identify yourself and your affiliation. Uh, we'll start with uh, Coach Beard, and then we'll go into, uh, that'll go to 105, and then we'll have uh, the student athletes from 105 to 120. So as soon as Coach is ready, we'll be underway. Hammond, you guys ready? We're good to go? Okay. So, Coach, we're going to open up with a statement from you, and then we'll open up the floor to questions whenever you're ready. And I'm just really uh, excited to be here and coaching this team. I've never enjoyed coaching a team more than I have this one. We just simply stated don't want it to end. You know, we just want to go another day. We've enjoyed practice and traveling and film sessions and strength conditioning and just everything with these guys. Uh, that's kind of who we are. It's just a team, guys that play for each other. So we um, are just really excited to be one of the 16 teams left standing. Um, in terms of this game, uh, we have so much respect for Michigan's program. You know, on behalf of everybody in our program, I'll speak for our players and staff. We just uh, want to say how much respect we have. This is our third year building the program, and we'll often you know, study other programs, whether it be something we saw on the news or in a magazine or read or maybe even X's and O's, the end of a game. Uh, I can't tell you how many times the last three years we've talked about Michigan basketball with our guys, whether it be their defense, one of the best defenses in college basketball, we strive to be in that same conversation, which I think we are, um, or just their culture, um, their tradition, uh, their fan base. So uh, this is a game that we're uh, excited to be a part of. And at the top of the reason for the list of why, it's our respect uh, for Michigan. You know, lastly, uh, with Coach, he's just somebody that I've always looked up to personally. Um, I'm very proud of my background in small college basketball, whether it be NAIA or Division II um, or junior college. And obviously, Coach is um, somebody that all of us look up to in coaching because of his experience and success at all the different levels. And um, you know, I think as a young coach, people have you know pictures of um, you know, Coach Lombardi or um, Coach Wooden up in their office, and I certainly respect those people too, but Coach Beeline's always been a guy that me and my circle of friends look up to because he's a guy that's coached at all different levels and uh, proven, you know, if you're a good coach, you're a good coach regardless of what level you're at. Um, so we have a lot of respect for Michigan's program and coach. We're going to start in the third row here. I've got lots of hands up, so go ahead. Sports. Um, I, I wondered if you could take me back to your uh, time in Las Vegas when Texas Tech uh, showed interest in you. How how tough of a decision was that uh, going to Tech, and uh, um, can you kind of take me through what what led you to leave? Yeah, I'm going to respectfully decline on that. This is about Texas Tech, Michigan, and Sweet 16. I think that I've uh, been more than open about that uh, decision. Uh, nothing but respect for the people in Las Vegas and UNLV. Um, but I respectfully decline on that today. Today's about Texas Tech. It's about us being in our second consecutive Sweet 16 and playing one of the best teams in the country tomorrow, a real national championship contender, Michigan. We're going to go to the gentleman in the white and then behind him to the gentleman in the blue. David Collier from the ABC in Lubbock. How are you doing, Coach? I know you're not good with two, but I'm going to try to get him in anyway. First one, um, what do you remember from the first meeting that you had as an assistant at Texas Tech back in 2005 against Beeline in West Virginia? And second question, what scares you about this Michigan team most? Uh, was an assistant for Coach Knight and Pat at Texas Tech. Really proud of my association, my time there as an assistant, here as an assistant. Um, that was a Sweet 16 game in Albuquerque. 
in the historic pit. Uh, it was a great game. Uh, West Virginia, pit snoggle. I still have uh, bad dreams about him from time to time. Uh, defense for that guy was not letting him get the ball because once he got it, it was going in. Uh, but it, my recollection, it was about a, a one possession game and uh, we were playing offense in front of our bench in the last possession of the game and we got like two or three tips at the ball that I think either would have sent the game to overtime or maybe given us the victory. Ball didn't quite go in. West Virginia secured the rebound. Um, but they were really well coached as they are today. Um, that's a game, although I don't like the outcome, thinking back, it was kind of special. A Sweet 16 game. We have two of those guys on our staff right now as graduate assistants. Our players, Ronald Ross and Daryl Dorr, both played in that game. Um, second part of the question, you know, what concerns me or scares me about Michigan? Everything, you know, starts with their Hall of Fame coach. Uh, simply stated, this team doesn't beat themselves. If you're going to beat Michigan, you got to go beat them. You got to go score more points than them. And so um, we understand that. We'll have to play our cleanest game of the year. We'll have to play our best 40 minutes. But that's what this time of year is. This game is no different than any other ones around. You know, as you advance in the tournament, you got to eventually play your best game to play on Monday night. So this is the next step for us. A lot easier to talk about than do. Um, Michigan has great talent, in my uh, opinion. Uh, several NBA players um, got great size, great guard play. Uh, they're really, really good. Best defensive team maybe we played all year. And an offensive balance that um, really concerns us. But we'll have to play really well. In the blue, and then we'll go to the middle here. Brian Bush, uh, Michigan Radio Network. Coach, you mentioned studying Michigan. Uh, a lot externally has been made about two of the top defenses in the country. So what do you see as, as similarities and differences between your defense and Michigan's? Um, well, I'll say this about Michigan, and I hope that people have the same view about us, but that's not uh, – that's just be my opinion. But when I think of uh, Michigan, I think, again, of discipline. Uh, they don't beat themselves. They're a low turnover team. I think they have the fewest turnovers of anybody in Division One this year, around nine a game. That means you're not beating yourself. On the defensive end, it's very hard to get easy baskets against them because of their scheme, their players, their discipline. They have size, they have athleticism. So I would hope the people, when they talk about Texas Tech, they also recognize that we try to make it hard for the opponent to score and that we try to you know, value the ball and get shots as well. We're going to go right here in the middle, please. Uh, hey, Coach, Eddie Pels from AP. You've been famously quoted as saying, guys like you get one chance. Um, and I, I was wondering, now that you've had some success, do you still feel there's something creeping over your shoulder all the time? And, and how do you pass that message on to your players? Uh, absolutely. You know, I wake up every day feeling like the underdog, that I got something to prove. You know, I set three alarms to make sure that I was five minutes early today to video to set that standard for our players. I had the cell phone. Uh, I had one of my uh, daughters call me, and then I had the alarm set in the hotel, which I hadn't done that in a long time. Uh, those things are tricky, man. Got the cords going in and out of them. Bluetooth. Uh, yeah, I'm always trying to act like I belong, and um, I think that's just kind of – that's just me. And um, – how I keep those players uh, kind of feeling the same way. It's just who we are. You know, we, um, we've got really good players, uh, but we don't have any McDonald's All-Americans. We don't have anybody on our team that's been given anything. Uh, you know, Jared Culver's worked for everything he's got. Um, and I can say that about every one of our players. So um, it's just who we are. It's not some kind of motivational game ploy. It's we believe it. You know, we got a chip on our shoulder. Um, you know, we weren't supposed to be here. They picked us bottom half or last in our league. Uh, even today, we see people around the country calling out, you know, that Buffalo was going to beat us, this and that. So um, we respect everybody's opinion, uh, but we fear no one. And we're here to try to play our best game of the year, and we're here to try to advance. And uh, we understand how hard this is going to be because Michigan is really, really good. Um, but we have a lot of confidence in ourselves, too. All the way in the back corner, please. Coach, uh, Reed Forgrave with CBS Sports HQ. I I'd love as expansive as an answer as you care to give it for this. Uh, I I'm curious, like, when you first saw Jarrett Culver play, what you, what jumped out to you about him, and how it has been that he's made this progress to a point where a lot of us talk about him as a lottery pick? Yeah, I saw Jarrett early on in his career. Um, obviously, with my time in Lubbock, knew of Culver and um, my – background in the state of Texas. So I think when we were at Angelo State and um, Little Rock, Culver was coming up. 
obviously saw him on the circuit when I was a coach at Arkansas Little Rock, but we weren't going to be able to recruit somebody of his, um, you know, his status, but watched him play in some games. Um, the very first thing we did when we got to Texas Tech, he was the first phone call we made. And so it, it wasn't some kind of great eval. I mean, the guy's got length and athleticism, can score on all three levels, and got great character. So um, we have known about Culver for a long time. He was our first call, and just really proud of him, um, you know, making history. I remember our very first talk with Culver. I was like, look, you're going to be able to go to a lot of different places and be a part of history. Um, but, you know, why don't you think about staying home and come to Texas Tech and we'll make history. And I think that's exactly what he's done. You know, 1,000-point score in two years, Big 12 Player of the Year. Uh, has helped this team get to two straight NCAA tournaments. First time in Tech history, back-to-back -back Sweet 16. So I think you got to give Jared a lot of credit for being one of our best players. All right, any further questions? Final call. All right, thank you, Coach. Thanks. All right, we'll be back at it at 1.05 with student athletes from Texas Tech. As a reminder, the locker room is open if you wish to speak to someone who's not going to be up here uh, on the table, you can go to the locker room right now, which is on this side of the building.
All right, we're about ready to get underway with Texas Tech student athletes. We have Brandon Francis, Tariq Owens, Dorenz Odiasi, and Matt Mooney. We'll open up to questions from the floor just as soon as we get everybody settled. I see a couple late runners coming in, possibly. Nope, they're going out the other door. All right, so if everybody's ready, start with questions. Don't everybody raise your hand at once. Go ahead, right there. Brian Bush, Michigan Radio Network, uh, for, for all you guys. But, Matt, I'll start with you. Just what stands out about Michigan? Coach Beard talked about the fact that you guys uh, in meetings have sometimes referenced Michigan as a team to look at as you build your program. So what stands out about the Wolverines? Yeah, we think Michigan is uh, probably the best team we've played all year up there with Duke and uh, top teams in the Big 12, Kansas, Kansas State. Uh, you know, they're really well coached. Obviously, Coach Beeline, great coach. Um, you know, we've heard that it's the number one and number two defense is going at it. So, um, you know, and they, their experience, they went to the national championship last year. So they got, a, they got a really good mix of guys, length, athleticism, size. So they're a real good team, really balanced. Lorenz? Uh, they're a top, top program, blue blood type program. Uh, always have get to this level. Um, they always play in the postseason. Uh, our program looks after their program in, in, in that aspect. Uh, they're great, well-coached uh, guys that have been on this stage before and not scared of this moment, and we just got to be ready to play them when we play them tomorrow. Tariq, you want to talk about that at all, or have we covered it? Uh, yeah, they pretty much covered everything. Okay. <laughs> all right, we're going to go to Mark Wicker in the very back, please. Yeah, Mark Wicker, Orange County Register. I wanted to ask Tariq and Matt, about Coach Beard, and you, know, you hear it, but he is very, very detail-oriented. He comes up with details that maybe you guys didn't even, maybe had not even thought about at the previous schools that you were at. What would be an example of something that he came up with as a detail that you were surprised that he, he came up with? Um, I don't really, I can't really recall anything specific right now, but um, no, you're right. Coach Beard, you know, he has all like the random stats and the little details that, that um, in my experience at other schools, we didn't we didn't really point out. Uh, they didn't really factor in as major details, but to to Coach Beard in this program, um, you know, everything every little thing helps. Um, so I've come to enjoy it. I like um, I enjoy the information. I like how they give us so much. Um, personally, it's, it's cool for me. Yeah, one de I mean, he's a very detailed person. You know, Coach Beard, he's a different breed. You know, he's just he's a killer. Um, but one of the one of the details that I can think of is uh, free throws. For example, we all have different um, like keys that we have to focus on when we step up to the free throw line. So in practice, like we'll step up to the free throw line, and one of our GAs has to memorize like everybody's key. So every time I step up to the free throw line, it's hand under the ball, finish on your toes, and everybody's got something different. And like in our locker room, in the bathroom, they got like the sheet posted above the urinals that has everybody's free throw keys. So like even when you're in the bathroom, you seeing that like in your head, like, okay, these are my keys when I step up to the free throw line. So just things like that. Brandon, do you, you want to say anything? You've been awfully quiet down there. I'm good. No, you're good? <laughs> All right. In the very back corner, please. Yeah, uh, for Tariq, uh, Reed could you Forgrave. identify yourself, please? Yeah, I'm just about to. Uh, Reed Forgrave, CBS Sports HQ. Uh, Tariq, you you've really blossomed on the defensive end, especially under Coach Beard, and I'm curious what sets his approach apart from other college coaches you've had, specifically on the defensive end. What's different about him? Um, our process. Um, you know, we have our own workouts uh, that that we schedule. We make on our own time. And um, during my workouts, I mean, I work on it uh, every single day. We have GAs uh, who are short and quick and really explosive and fast, and um, I guard them every day. We play one-on-one. -on -one. Um, I work on closeout situations, switches, things like that. So um, I improved because I improved because we worked on it. Uh, we do it every single day. So, um, and I really enjoy that about this program. Uh, everybody has things that we need to work on, and our coaching staff, instead of just telling us we need to work on them, uh, they put plans in place for us to work on them. So, um, you know, and I really enjoyed that about this program. Do you want to follow up? Go ahead. I mean, I'm curious just about the specifics. Like, what, 
what specific plan is, is, is like one thing that uh, the coaching staff put in place uh, to bring your defense to this next level? Um, like I just said, just defensively uh, in, in my workouts, uh, I'll work on uh, switching ball screens and just sit down and guarding and guarding some of our people off ball screens. Um, that's just one thing. Right there in the Michigan shirt. Uh, Brian Bush, Michigan Radio Network. Uh, for, for the three of you who have transferred, who didn't start your career here, uh, what is it about Coach Beard and this program that, that drew you here? And, and how has he been able to acclimate what was a, a program that had five seniors leave last year? And, and you know, some of you guys have been here just one year, a couple years. What is it about it that you guys are able to, to, to become you know, a, a team as quickly as you guys are and, and be a successful one at that? Matt, why don't you start? We'll just work our way down the table. Okay. Um, yeah, I actually remember Coach Beard's team at Arkansas Little Rock. I remember uh, their story. I think they had 10 new players, and he brought them to the tournament in his first year there, and they beat Purdue in the first round. So when he was recruiting me, I knew he had experience with new guys um, and having success right away. So that was something that played a factor for me. Um, he's just really good at, I mean, right when I first got here, you know, he just – made me uh you know feel included and like you know confident right away he told the guys you know he talked me up a little bit in front of the guys and you know he's real good at uh putting guys in the right positions and um just making you feel like you know you're part of the team right away next um yeah uh, you know we just do so much stuff together i mean as a team off the floor we do a lot of things together um just get together, hang out with each other. We all live right next to each other, so it's very easy for us to be around each other. Uh, we spend a lot of time together in the gym, putting up extra shots together on our own time. So, um, you know, it's it's very easy when we put when we spend that much time together. You know, to you know build a chemistry, and it happened pretty quickly. Anyone else? Uh, for me, uh, when I first got to Lubbock, it was you know a new beginning, but. Uh, if I could make the shows all over again, I would. Uh, I got my joy back for the game. I met a lot of great people. I got better on and off the floor. And uh, I really just started having fun when I first got to Texas Tech. And, um, you know, I always be thankful for that. Uh, continue to write the story, just trying to finish strong. All right, any further questions for the student athletes? Final call. All right, thank you, gentlemen. All right, we will be back at 2.05 with student athletes from Michigan, followed at 2.20 by Coach Beeline from Michigan. So Michigan has just arrived at the venue. Uh, we're about three minutes out from the scheduled start of the press conference. I'll let you know as soon as I hear word uh, that the student athletes are on their way. Jack, can you please let me know when you guys are on the way? All right, just let me know when you're in route. Then you can let me know when you're in route.
All right, I'm told that the student athletes from Michigan are on their way. Uh, we'll go through our introductions real quick. For those of you who need the transponder or the uh, satellite information, it is Galaxy 17, transponder 14B. Downlink, downlink frequency is 11975.5V as in Victor. 11975.5V as in Victor. Uh, in a few moments, we'll be joined by student athletes Xavier Simpson, Charles Matthews, and Ignis Brazdikas. Uh, and we will go until 2.20 or until you all run out of questions. And then we'll be joined by Coach John Beeline from 2.20 to 2.35. That will wrap up the interview uh, room part of today's agenda. As a reminder, the locker room will be open during that window of time as well. So if there's anybody you'd like to speak to who is not going to be up here, you can make your way to the Michigan locker room, which is on the far side of the building. As a reminder, if you'd please take a moment to silence your cell phone, even those on your wristwatch, please. We don't want any disruptions on, uh, during the press conference. As a reminder, there are no, no video may be taken in this room, still photos only, regardless of device. Uh, please raise your hand. I will call on you in the order that I see you as the best I can. Um, please wait for the microphone. Before asking your question, we have two microphone holders, David and Gail, uh, on either side. They will get a microphone to you. Uh, when you get your microphone, please take a moment to identify yourself and your affiliation before asking your question. If you don't, I'm going to interrupt you and ask you to identify yourself and your affiliation. Uh, we have Tony, Aaron, and Les as our stenography team. They're going to be taking the copious notes, and they will have uh, the quotes and such out uh, within minutes at the end of this press conference, they will be sent up to the NCAA server and appear in the uh, inboxes over there. Any questions? Great. I'm told they're on their way, but it's a little bit far from the other side of the building, so we'll give them a couple minutes. Y'all ready? All right. We're joined by student athletes Xavier Simpson, Charles Matthew, and I'm hopefully going to say this right since you're sitting right next to me, Ignis Brazdakis. I've been working on it. All right, so we're going to open up to questions. I'll call on you in the order that I see you. Please raise your hand, and we'll uh, get you guys out here. First of all, welcome to Anaheim, gentlemen. Any questions for the student athletes? Don't everyone raise your hand at once, or I'll start randomly calling on people. Go ahead. Hey, uh, Reed Forgrave, CBS Sports HQ. Uh, question for Charles. I'm, I'm curious. You've been around this program for a while, and this program used to be, John Beeline used to be known as this offensive guru, and yet the past couple of years, you guys have been one of the best defensive coach, defensively coached teams in college basketball. What's, what's the difference? Uh, and I know this is something that you guys went into a lot last year during the Final Four, but what's the difference the past couple of years uh, as far as the focus on defense? Uh, I, feel like, I feel like Coach B still is an offensive guru. Um, he still has a great amount of uh, offensive schemes and offensive concepts that we continue to build upon and grow upon. But uh, we definitely do focus in on the defensive end, and uh, it's been a change of personnel as well. So it's always helpful when you have players that you know are more acceptable to guarding, guarding better at their positions as well. Ignis, you want to talk a little bit about, as a newcomer to the program, talk a little bit about the, did, did the defense have anything to do with you wanting to come here, or what, what were your thoughts? Yeah, I would definitely say um, 
you know, I knew that the defense was going to be intense once I got here. I talked to Coach Yak a lot, and he let me know that, you know, if you're not going to be willing to play defense, you're not going to play. So I was definitely ready for that kind of environment and that, um, you know, toughness on the defensive end. But, yeah, I feel like we've definitely grown a lot defensively, and, uh, you know, that's definitely contributed to the coaches. All right, any questions for the student? We'll go in the red shirt, please, right there. Jackson Frank, Gonzaga Bulletin. This one's for Xavier. You've become pretty renowned for that sweeping hook shot you have. I'm kind of wondering how that came about and how it's such a big part of your, your offensive arsenal. Um, <clears throat> it came about, uh, I would say, my freshman year um, in the summer in open gym. Um, I accidentally did it. And um, from then on, I just wanted to perfect my craft, um, having different uh, finishing building around a big man down there. Um, there's some big guys, um, some footers, and there has to be um, other ways that you have to score. That's not going to be a layup. So um, I kind of did on accident, um, start perfecting my craft on it, start working on it, and uh, it became more like my routine with my workouts and um, off the court action as well. Did you pattern it after anybody? Was there anybody you you tried to emulate while you as you developed it? I didn't. Um, I kind of just wanted to make my own little style. Obviously, there are some um, great people, um, great sports people who have um, hooks. But in a way, I kind of just wanted to make my own style. Any further questions? In the back, in the white shirt with the red tie, please. David Collier from the ABC in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, for any of you guys, what does Texas Tech do offensively? That Everybody's talking about the defense of matchup, but what does Texas Tech do offensively that could cause you guys problems? Xavier, let's start with you and just work our way back down this way. Uh, there's some great players on the team. They can really shoot the ball. Um, the one, two, and three man can really shoot it. Um, they have a great player that's all around. Um, I feel like the point guard is extremely talented. Um, he sees the floor well. Um, they play together, and a lot of them can score in many different ways. Charles? Uh, yeah, they're a very versatile group. Um, you know, they have good size at all positions, um, very athletic, be able to play above the rim. So, you know, they present their challenges as well. So, it'll be a fun game. Goodness, you want to add anything? Uh, yeah, they're a great team. Uh, I feel like a lot. You know, they do well converting their defense to offense. And, you know, that's definitely a strength for them. And uh, they've got a lot of different threats on the offensive end. And, you know, it's definitely going to be a great matchup for us to uh, defend and, and, and play our game. Any more questions? That's all we got? All right, last call. Thank you, gentlemen. All right, we will be back at 2.20 with Coach John Beeline. This team has at least one challenging name. 
that's why you asked him to send you the pronunciation guide in advance and practice. I can say Ignis Bartakis, but I can't say uh, what's his face, Dan Munson. Munson. Munson, Munson.
All right, we're joined by Michigan head coach John Beeline, and we'll open up with a statement from coach and then open it up to questions. You all know how to do this by now, so coach, the floor is yours. Yeah, so uh, we're thrilled to be here. Uh, obviously, it looks like a great location. Uh, love Michigan. It's great, good to be out of a little winter setting and have such um, beautiful weather here. So uh, we've got a great, uh, incredible opponent that we're playing against, Texas Tech. And great defense, great offense, great players, brilliant coaching staff. And uh, it's going to be really difficult for us to score points. I hope it's difficult for them to score points. And, uh, but both teams have good players, and uh, that's what we'll end up deciding this game. Uh, got to make open shots if we get any. And then we got to be able to score the ball against some, a really good defense. So it should be a great game. And uh, we're looking forward. We're just so, so happy to be at this point, but not content just by being here. We'd like to uh, continue this uh, ride that we've been on here really all season long. Okay, we'll open up to questions. We're going to start right there, go right there and then right behind you. Joe Reedy, Associated Press. John, how much of a strange feeling of deja vu is this, being back in the West Regional and <laughs> three of the teams you faced last year are here with you? Yeah, I, I think when we when we heard the news, uh, well, we knew we were coming out here, but I heard the news we were playing, uh, and it was just Texas A&M, Texas Tech instead of Texas A&M with the other two same teams. We just said follow the same itinerary. I and I and I moved it. I moved departure back up like an hour because I felt we got here a little bit late last year. But I said whatever we did, because we played really well against Texas A&M last year, let's just do the same thing. So uh, it, it is unusual to go to the West Coast and a similar site twice in a row, but. You know, uh, we have we tra we we don't travel well. Uh, as far we don't need to travel well because we have so many alums in California. Yeah, we took over the Staples Center. And I, I I'm sure there were a lot of be in in uh, attendance here t uh, tomorrow. We're gonna go right there in the tie and then in the green shirt. We'll be right after. Reed Forgrave with CBS Sports HQ. Uh, I'm curious if you see any of yourself in Coach Beard, sort of a coach who is taking a bit of an unconventional path. You know, I haven't, you know, I, I, did, I don't spend a lot of time, uh, you know, studying the other coaches. Uh, it, it is a, uh, I, all I know is that he can really coach. You know, I think he came up at, at Texas Tech, perhaps with Bobby Knight. I was trying to get filled in and out today a little bit. And, um, but anytime you have, I, I was at several head coaching spots before I got a, 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 a job. I think he's been a head coach at a junior, co junior college, right? Right, and then the um, his position at at Arkansas Little Rock, and then on to here. But uh, I uh, I have a lot of respect for what he's been able to do because, as, as you know, the Big 12 is a great conference, and for him to be co-champs in just what his second or third year, that's amazing. We we'll go to the gentleman in the greenish gray shirt right there, and then we'll have against the pole. Sam Dodd, SB Nation. Um, John, did you get a chance? I was wondering if you got a chance to see Aubrey Dawkins in yeah. the Central Florida game, and just a, how proud you are because no. you used to play, and then any potential thoughts on, uh, you know, kind of pro potential there? Uh, yeah, I, I uh, you know, when he came in as a freshman, he was a, we had, we had had a, a huge attrition year to the NBA. Uh, Johnny and I have been friends for a while. We're both on the same NCA Ethics Coalition, one of the, fir the first ones, first members. And so there I was, Nick Stouse is going to decide to go, Glenn's decide to go, and Mitch, now Mitch Mary, McGarry's going to go. We've got three scholarships. So I call I, I called Johnny, and uh, we got it going, and, and we ended up getting him. And uh, he really had a terrific, a terrific first two years of development, and and you know he he had 30 points one time in a game as a freshman. He just didn't miss. So his injuries have, have set him back, but also the red shirt year, he's developed so many different areas of his game, and he's and he's a, a high wire act like his daddy. So uh, it's great to see it. I text uh, Aubrey, uh, Tracy. And uh, Johnny, uh, right after the game, they've all gotten back to me, and really, uh, everyone's. Uh, uh, there's a lot of gratitude both ways for, for and happiness both ways. We're gonna go standing against the pole right there. Uh, Aaron Torres, Fox Sports. Just coach, you know, we this time last year we saw a team that eventually uh, went to the Final Four. You lose Mo, and I think from the outside, at least to some of us in the media, that were 100% incorrect. You know, it, it looked like you lost a lot. What At what point, was it during the summer, was it the Villanova game, where you realized that even though you did lose a lot, this group in its own right could be special? Well, we, we lost more than Mo. Uh, Duncan Robinson and Muhammad Ali, Abdul Rahman, and Jerron Simmons were like 
all just, oh, we won that game because of those guys several times. And Mo was obviously ter terrific. So, no, we went into this year with uh, just thinking, okay, let's just, we're young. We don't have a fourth year player, a real true fourth year player. We got a couple of th three year players who didn't play much in their first year, whether it was John, um, whether it was Charles or, or Xavier. And let's just see where we can go. It's the future's bright because we probably should have everybody back. And so as a result, uh, we really went into it with very modest goals other than let's just get better every day. And all of a sudden we, we uh, and, and we had a summer tour, which probably that's why we're good because I didn't make it because I had open heart surgery. So we, uh, we ended up just going to Villanova saying, okay, let's, I'm just thinking, the last time we played Villanova wasn't good and all of a sudden we're up 20 at half. And I said, well, maybe we got something here. And to the North Carolina game, Purdue game, all great teams, and we played at home. It just sort of kept getting, they kept getting better. And um, they, we have no distractions on this team. We have just great young men that love to be coached up. And, uh, and we, you know, if you're gonna be a good teacher, you gotta have good students. We have good students. We're gonna go back to the gentleman in the tie right there. Yeah, uh, just following up from earlier, Reed Forgrave, CBS Sports. Um, the, I'm curious that the path that you've taken, I know this is something you've talked about at past Final Fours, but what's the, the pluses and minuses of the, I don't know if you call it non-traditional path or just not yeah. just like, hey, I'm in the blue blood and keep going. Yeah, no, the, the biggest plus is you get to lose when nobody cares, <laughs> seriously. And you just beat yourself up. You know, you know how many times at you know, Erie Community College and Nazareth and Lemoyne, right, you lost games and it was like, really, everybody didn't, they, there wasn't this, you know, people weren't, weren't hounding the newspapers and talk radio and all these things. And you make a lot of mistakes and you really learn, you know, on your own. Where when you're an assistant, you know, you, well, I would have done this. I went, well, really, do you really know that would have worked? You know, you tried it. It didn't work. Don't ever do it again, right, is your mentality. Or I got I to gotta be better in these areas. A lot of self-examination because you know it's, it's, it's riding on you. Yeah, you know, those are, all those first... 15 formative years, I didn't have a full-time assistant. When I went to Canisius, I said, what do you guys do? You know, and, and so it's, uh, that was really helpful for me. It was painful, but it, it was so helpful. Aaron, go ahead. Yeah, I would follow up on Reed's question right there. Aaron Torres, Fox Sports. What, it's been a long time since, you know, those younger days, but where have you evolved as a coach? Where do you feel like you've grown the most, and what did you learn in those formative years? I, I, what I learned is you have to continue to change. Uh, that uh, it's, ama it's amazing. A couple of things happened this year, and I just, it took me 44 years to realize that. How, how simple is that? But I had never heard of it. I'm not going to tell you. Uh, it, it's it, like things that, that people are doing today's game, right, that you would never do. I mean, there was, there was only one way to play I, when, as I started. You know, that you went to a John Wooden and Dean Smith and Bobby Knight Clinic, and that's what you did. And their word was law, and that's all you did. And if it didn't work, well, I got to get better players. And then all of a sudden you realize you don't have better players, and if you want to keep your job, you better evolve. And if you want your team to win, you better evolve. So, I mean, I still, I, I want to apologize to some of my teams back in the day that probably could have been better if I knew what I knew now. And, and same thing with, the, with Easton. There's a couple games we could have won this year if I was a smarter coach for what I've learned in the last month. The geometry of this game is amazing, right? And, but there's still some things that aren't going to change. But you have to be receptive to both. Keep your fundamentals, right? The, the important things, communication, stance, right? Great attitudes. Uh, got, having guys that can shoot the ball and pass are all important. But schemes, you better be, continue to change or you won't hang around very long. People, that computer changed everything. Everybody's on everything. Long answer, good question. Any more questions? Go ahead, yeah, please. Oh, you want, okay, yeah, right here in the third row, please. Hey, Coach, Eddie Pels from AP. Um, what do you, there's all this talk about possibly changing the one and done rule. That yeah. usually, we talk about that a lot. Do you think that, you know, if, if high school kids could go straight to the pros again, could that change the, the dynamic, how you recruit, the quality? Do you see any? Yeah, I, I think that uh, it won't change us very much. It will change some other programs. I mean, we've never said we're not going to take a one and done guy. But at the same time, you know, we're going we're gonna to be very open with a young man that we're, we, you're coming to, this is not a, this is a destination. This is not a stopover. And if you're ready to go pro, we'll drive you to the airport, all right? Or if the pros, you know, if pros want you, we'll drive you to the airport. 
But at the same time, that's, we're not going to say, well, we can't win without a one-and-done guy. I mean, we've been doing it. And so we're, it's not going to change us a great deal. Um, and, and as I said, your last thing you want is a kid in, um, in, in your, on your team that wants to be somewhere else. And so it, and it's, it's fine. It doesn't, it, I'm, you know, it's not, I'm not going to say they're bad kids. They're, that's fine. But, but Michigan is Michigan, and we want the right kid who's, who wants the whole college experience, whether it's for one, two, three, or four years, but not just as a stopover to, you know, to play basketball, stop going to class, and then win and go, then go. That hasn't worked for a lot of teams. If you really look at the numbers, it does not work very well uh, for, for winning basketball. Any further questions? In the very back, win the red tie, please. Coach David Collier from the ABC in Lubbock, Texas. Uh, I know you said you didn't know much about study the other coaches, uh, but what have you seen from this Texas Tech defense that maybe is similar or different to what you guys do? Well, they, they have more pressure on the ball than we do. They create more steals. Uh, they create more. Or they have more steals. They have more turnovers, or they create more turnovers. So they're they're going to try and not let you run some some things. Uh, they switch every screen everywhere. Uh, at least what we've seen, almost every screen. That's hard to that's hard to score against. So it's it's a a, a really good plan. Uh, it's very similar to some 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 others that we've seen in the past. And sometimes we've done really well against that. And sometimes it's been a struggle. So I hope it's I hope we can we can find ways to score some points uh, tomorrow because it is difficult against them. And most teams have found that out. Any more questions? Final call. All right. Thank you, Coach right, Bieland. Good luck everyone. tomorrow. Thank you.